Jesus, and that's who we're going to talk about again tonight, Jesus, and I want to speak to you for a few minutes tonight on the subject of Jesus, mighty in word and deed, mighty in word and deed. We have come to this paragraph beginning at verse 21 in chapter 1, and as you find that passage, would you stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word? Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished. They were breathtaking. They were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. 
Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, that is a demonic spirit. And he, that is the demon, cried out saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, muzzled him is actually the word there, muzzled him and said, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Let's pray together. Well, Father, we're so grateful. We're so grateful for Jesus. And Lord, it's our purpose. We've purposed in our heart, we've intentioned in our heart that, that he and he alone be lifted up here. And so, Lord, as we come together a night tonight to, to lift up Jesus, Father, we pray that you will just use what is proclaimed tonight in a powerful and mighty way to change us and make us more like Jesus. Father, we think about our youth and the chaperones, the adults that have gone with them tonight to the meeting there at the high school. And Father, we just pray that the power of God would be evident in that meeting tonight. And Lord, we pray that you would just uh, meet with them in strength and that there be life-changing decisions made, decisions that will affect all of eternity tonight. And Father, we know that you are here with us. You've said that where two or more gather together in your name, there you are in their midst. And so, Lord, we have your promise. And Lord, we've also experienced your presence tonight and what, what we have experienced in the worship. So now, Lord, just please guide us and help us to, to truly be changed tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you be seated, please? Jesus, mighty in word and in deed. And when we think about this thing of, of Jesus and his teaching ministry, we realize that that in the book of Mark, I don't know how carefully you have noticed this, but in the book of Mark we find out that, that several, many times as a matter of fact, some 15 times Jesus is referred to as the teacher. And some dozen other times it refers to the fact that he has taught, just as it does right here. The content of Jesus' teaching is not so much presented in the book of Mark. We need to go to Matthew and to Luke to find the content of his teaching in John also. And occasionally we're going to do that as we study the life of Jesus. But in Mark, mainly he speaks of him as a teacher, about his teaching, but he doesn't get into the, to the content of what Jesus taught. When we think about Jesus being mighty in word, when we think about ourselves, those of us that, that are called upon to preach the word and to teach the word, it's an awesome responsibility. The Bible even goes on to say that, that there should not be many teachers among us. That, there, that you ought to take it seriously. And I, I believe that the people in, in Temple Baptist Church that have the, the awesome responsibility of teaching, and, and some of our men are even preachers, we take this very seriously. It is an awesome thing to speak for God and to speak God's Word. The difference between a speaker and a preacher or teacher of the word is that a, a speaker has to say something. A preacher has something to say if he's preaching the word. Amen? But it's an awesome thing to, to present the word of God to, to anyone, even one-on-one, -on -one, let alone to a, a body of people. It's an awesome thing. And it should not be something that someone just rushes into. Donald Gray Barnhouse was a, a, a well-known preacher and pastor and was on the radio back in the, in the 40s and early 50s and, and uh, pastored a large Presbyterian church. I've got some of his tapes. Wonderful man of God. And old Don Gray Barnhouse one day was 
riding along in a car with a friend of his, and, and they both loved classical music, and as they were riding along, they began to talk about music, and his friend said, uh, said no, he said, what is your favorite symphony? And, and Barnhouse said, well, my favorite symphony is Brahms' first symphony. And the man said, well, I, let's see, now how does that go? And Barnhouse started to whistle it. He started to whistle this symphony for the man. And as he was whistling, he thought to himself, oh, my, 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 how silly it is for me to try to whistle this great symphony. <laughs> and friend, listen, that's the way it is when we stand to proclaim the Word of God. And we think, oh my goodness, I think, oh me, how can I ever get across the awesomeness of, of the Word of God and what God has to say? It says here that when Jesus taught, they were breathtaking at His teaching. Breathtaking, that's what this word translated here, astonished, really means. It took their breath away. The way that Jesus taught, it says He didn't teach them like the scribes that they were used to hearing. Now these scribes weren't necessarily bad men, but they just didn't have what Jesus had. As a matter of fact, I feel kind of sorry for those, those scribes trying to teach and preach the Word of God without the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. I feel kind of sorry for them. And it wasn't that those men were necessarily bad men, the scribes, those that taught and, and were experts in the law of God. It wasn't that they were bad, but they just didn't have what Jesus had. And it says here that they, they were astonished at His teaching because He taught with authority. And I want us to think about this, about Him being mighty in word. And think about this matter of the authority that Jesus displayed. Sometimes we think about authority. We think about an authoritative uh, position that someone might be given on the job somewhere. Have you ever seen someone get a little bit of authority on the job and, and just go, uh, go off the deep end with it? Have you ever seen that? There's an old Yugoslavian proverb that says, if you really want to know what a man is like, give him a little authority. <laughs> but the kind of authority that Jesus had, he could handle he could handle it. After all, he was God the Son. And it says here that he had authority. Now what was this authority that Jesus had? I want to think about this authority in three ways. First of all, he had the authority of character. He had the authority of character. You see, they had never heard anyone preach like Jesus and teach like Jesus because he was the first holy one they had ever heard. These scribes that came, they were probably varying degrees of righteousness. You know, they were good sometimes, they were bad sometimes. They were just ordinary folks like you and I. But when they listened to Jesus speak, they were listening to someone that had the authority of a holy character. He's the Holy Son of God. He lived without sin. He was a sinless one. And those men that would come and would teach the law sometimes, they were not living the law. And some of us know what that's like. Some of us know what it's like to be like that train conductor that, that spent his whole career on one stretch of, of track and as they would go down that track he would call out the names of the towns they were going through or they were stopping at and he lived that all of his life and he felt like he'd been to all those places because he'd been on the track and called the names out. But listen, calling the names out and being at that place is two different things. And being able to call out the Word of God and living the Word of God is two different things also. You remember what I said a few uh, months back in a message that, that when our lives are like lightning, then our words are like thunder. Meaning by that, that when you live a life that's brilliant and shining, then your words will be heard. And Jesus had the authority that is the authority of character. And that set him apart from those scribes because the people knew those scribes and they knew where they failed. They knew their weaknesses. But with Jesus, they knew here was someone that needed to be listened to because he had true character. He was a holy man. He had that authority, which is the authority of character. But he also had the authority of perfect knowledge. A perfect knowledge. They never heard anyone preach like Jesus preached or teach like he taught because he taught like someone who knew what he was talking about. You see, they were those that would say, they would quote Rabbi uh, 
Rabbi Daniel or Rabbi uh, Dry as Dust or <laughs> Rabbi this or dry, Rabbi that. You know, and, well, this Rabbi said this and this Rabbi said that. But Jesus could say, Thus saith the Lord and make it stick. He knew what he was talking about. Somebody was uh, talking with old Harry, Harry Ironside. He was a gray old preacher a few uh, decades ago. And somebody was talking to old Harry Ironside. And he, and he said, well, Dr. Ironside, I must confess, I don't think that you are a very, that you are a very uh, outstanding preacher. And Ironside, well, I, I agree with you. But why do you feel that way? I know why. I, I, I believe that. Now, why do you believe that? And the guy said, because I can, I can understand everything you say. <laughs> because it wasn't deep you know and theological and mystical and all that that he was not hearing a great preacher well friend listen the great preacher is the one that makes it simple Amen. nothing I've ever no compliment I've ever had I don't have a whole lot but not many I've ever that mean as much as it used to be when we was over on the south side and those black folks would come up after a service and they'd say uh, Reverend Duncan when you preaches, I understand it. Oh, I love that. I love it. I love it. That's what we ought to do. Get the, get the hay down out of the loft and down on the, the floor of the barn where the cows can get at it. That's what it's all about. But see, Jesus, he went even further than that. See, he, could, he knew what he was talking about. As awesome as it it is to us when we study the Word of God and, and we begin to really get some kind of concept of what a, a lake of fire must be like. We don't really know what it's like, but Jesus, Jesus knows. And we talk about the streets of gold in heaven and those pearly gates and the wonders of glory. We get all excited, but friend, listen, we don't really know what it's like, but Jesus knew what it was like. He knew what he was talking about. He knew what he was talking about. And so when he stood in that synagogue or sat there in that synagogue and he, and he talked about the things of God, he spoke as someone who knew what he was talking about and he had authority as the authority of one with perfect knowledge. Oh man, wouldn't you love to have been there to hear Jesus teach the living word, teaching the written word. Oh, praise God. But not only that, he also had the authority of power. The authority of power. You see, Jesus taught with the anointing of the Holy Ghost on him. These folks had never heard anything like that. They'd never heard anybody come and, and with the power of God upon them, be able to explain the Word of God and to, to make application to it that touched them deeply down into the very place where they were living, as we say sometimes, the point of their greatest need. And they were breathtaking by the teaching of Jesus because He had authority. He had the authority of one that, that was, uh, uh, had the character to deliver. He was the one that had the perfect knowledge and knew what he was talking about. And Jesus also was the one that had the power of the Holy Ghost on him. And that gives us hope, doesn't it? You know that everything that Jesus did, he did in the power of the Holy Spirit. Why did he do that? Now, he had personal power, didn't he? I mean, He was God just like the Father, just like the Holy Spirit, and yet He chose to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, the power granted to Him by the Father. Why did He do that? He did that so we could see how it's supposed to be done. Amen. Because, friend, listen, that's the way we're supposed to operate. Don't try to operate in your own personal power. Man, you're a dead duck if you try to operate like that. <laughs> You're dead if you try to operate like that. We need to operate like Jesus did in the power of the Spirit of God. It is given to us, granted to us by the Father. Listen, Jesus was powerful. He was powerful. He was mighty in word. But He was not only mighty in word, He was also mighty in deed. Look at this with me. It says here that they entered the synagogue and he taught. They were astonished. Now look at verse 23. Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. The synagogue. What was a synagogue? What was it? That was a, that was a, a curious thing. A synagogue. Now the temple was in Jerusalem. 
the temple was there. That's where the sacrifices took place. That's where the holy days were observed. Well, what was the purpose of the synagogue? Well, there's various uh, thoughts about how the synagogue ever came into being. Most surely it was in place by the... the um, uh, Babylonian captivity when the, the children of Judah were taken away the children of Israel were taken away and they were in captivity in, in Babylon and these, these little groups would spring up and these little houses would be built places of, of, uh, of informal worship not the same kind of worship that took place in the temple but informal worship and also a place for learning a place for teaching and so these things were, were well in place and every city had its own synagogue and so Jesus would go into the synagogue and he would teach there. That's what he's doing right here. The synagogue was, a, uh, was arranged in such a way so that, that the people would come there for this informal worship and for uh, teaching sessions on the Word. And very often as a visiting rabbi would come to town, well, they would invite that visitor to speak to them. That's how Paul had the open doors that he had. Wherever he went, where did he go first? He always went to the synagogue. Why? Because he had an open door. And they would let him speak. The synagogue really began, uh, became a model for church, for the church. And the early church was modeled after the synagogue. Much of what we do here has its roots back there in the synagogue. And so Jesus went into the synagogue and, and look at this. He went in there. Here he goes to church, so to speak. And what does he find there? He finds a man with an unclean spirit. A man that is demon-possessed. Do you remember last week when we saw that video together? <clears throat> Do you remember the man in that called uh, Richard Land? Dr. Richard Land? Son of a ample guy, you know. And uh, anyway, Richard Land was our Sunday school teacher at First Baptist Dallas, and he's also a professor at Criswell Center. And I took all kind of classes from him. We know Richard well. And uh, he's a brilliant man. Now he's the head of the Christian Life Commission. And I remember one day in class, he said, don't think, man, that you're going to go out of this school and preach the Word of God in power like Dr. Criswell does, and people are going to love you. He said, you expect if you go out of here and you preach the Word of God, people are going to come against you. I remember that so well. And he was right. <laughs> That's right. And here Jesus, he, he goes into the synagogue and he's confronted. He's confronted right there in church by a man with an unclean spirit. Listen to what that man said to Jesus. Let us alone. <laughs> I've never had a, anyone in the congregation say those exact words, but I've sure seen them act that way. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. I like the way I'm doing. I like it. Leave me alone. What are we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Do you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now think about this. Here's a man in a place of worship with an unclean spirit. A man with a demonic spirit right there in church. Did you realize that the devil loves to go to church? He's got a perfect attendance record. When our men come and they pray, and really before we come in here we pray, and then when we come in here we pray, always somebody will ask God to bind Satan and to cast him from us. Why? Because Satan loves to come to church. Has a perfect attendance record. If you don't get him out of here, he's going to stay. Here's a man right there in a place of worship that is filled. I mean, this demon has complete and total control over this man. But when the Word of God is proclaimed and with power and the, and, the, and the Son of God is there, this demon shows himself. Now, I don't know if this man was a problem in the church or not. Maybe he was somebody that was always causing problems. It could be. It could be that, that for a long time they said, boy, I wish he'd either straighten up or move out, one or the other. I mean... It could have been a deal like that. I don't know. It's, we're not told anything about what went on before that. We're only told about what went on that day. This man wasn't necessarily a hypocrite. There's, we know there's hypocrites in the church. People say, well, I won't join the church because there's so many hypocrites. Well, come on, one more ain't going to matter. <laughs> I mean, what, what's one more? <laughs> 
I heard about a fellow that, I mean, he was down, 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 down on his luck. I mean, he could not get a job. I mean, he just couldn't find a job anywhere. And he finally went down to the zoo and tried to get a job at the zoo. And the guy said, man, I don't really have anything. He said, oh, hey, wait a minute. i tell you what we might do. My gorilla died last night. And he's a, everybody loves to see the gorilla. And, and i tell you what let's do. Let's get you a gorilla suit. And until I can get a new gorilla, you can be the gorilla. And the guy was, he needed a job so bad. He said, well, all right, I'll, I'll take it. If that's all I can do, I'll, I'll be the gorilla. So they got him a gorilla suit. He put on that gorilla suit and he got out into the cage and, and he started cutting all these monkey shines and everybody was coming around and, and the more they, the bigger the crowd and the more they laughed, the more he would do it. He was just having a good time. He found out he had latent acting ability and skill. I mean, he was enjoying this role of gorilla. And he saw a rope up there and he grabbed that rope and he started swinging around in that gorilla cage and everybody was applauding and screaming and yelling how oh, it was great and he swung higher and higher and the rope broke and he fell over into the lion's cage <laughs> and boy the lion came over and pounced on him <laughs> and the gorilla just lost he said oh, wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute help and the lion said shut up man you get us both fired <laughs> 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 That's what I heard from Bob George, <laughs> Jim. <laughs> that one goes way back. In. <laughs> but they're they're hypocrites in church. Some of these people are trying to, you know, put wear that mask and all. But this man here, he did He wasn't just being a hypocrite, friend. He had a demon in him. Now <clears throat> we have talked about and studied and in, in not too distant past about Satan and about demons and about the origin of Satan about the origin of demons so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that because we've just been through that not too long ago but let me remind you that these demonic spirits these unclean spirits they are those fallen angels that rebel with Satan against God there are some of them that are confined. They are in chains. Some are in chains for a specific time and they will be released during that period called the tribulation period. Others are so wicked that they are bound until the day of judgment. And hell was made for Satan and his angels, his demons. That's why this demon cries out and says, Will you come to destroy us now? And these uh, fallen angels, these demonic spirits, these unclean spirits are still in the world today. Amen. Now some in some theological circles, they don't believe that. Friend, I believe it because it's in the Word of God. Amen. So I may not be uh, up to date theologically, but as long as I stay with this book, I am in good shape. <laughs> and friend, we need to realize that, that demons are a reality. They are reality. George Harris, the pollster, in 1989 reported that in an 11-year period ending in 1988 that the statistics were this, that, that, uh, from, that uh, up from 27% of the population to 42% of the population had had some kind of supernatural experience that over 20 million Americans have had some kind of supernatural experience. Now friends, I believe in the supernatural. I believe in it. I believe in angels and I believe in demons. <clears throat> it's a reality that we need to know about and we need what, to know what to do about. And I, I tell you what, you can, you can go to two extremes when it comes to demons. You can go to the extreme that you don't believe that there's any such thing. You can go to that extreme that you do not believe that there's any demonic powers, that there's not anything like that, that that's all hokum, that's all mythology, that's not real. You can go from that extreme to the other extreme that is looking for a demon behind every blade of grass. And those are the extremes. And everything, these people over here that are seeing demons behind every blade of grass... Everything that happened, somehow a demon was involved in it. The devil made me do it. That's their theme song. But friend, listen, those are extremes. 
And we need to get out here in the, in, in the mainstream and not on the extremes. And we need to realize that, that there are entities like that. There are demonic powers. There are satanic powers that are, are trying to, to have sway over people, even Christians, even born-again, spirit-filled Christians. We need to realize that. And we need to be on guard about that. And we need to know how to combat those spirits. Are you an expert preacher? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I know some. I have some friends that have been deeply involved in, in deliverance ministry. I, thank the Lord I haven't been into that that much. But uh, I tell you what, it is a reality and we need to recognize it. And friend, listen to me. I just caution you also as time moves forward and as this the demonic influence in this country increases, you're going to see more and more and more and more of it. It's going to be. It isn't. It isn't that it's that it never has been here. It is that it's been so stu- subtle down through the years. But Satan doesn't have to be subtle anymore. Satan is not subtle now. Satan is strutting. Now, a lot of people have got the mistaken and the sad idea that Satan is somehow equal or more powerful than God. That is not so. Satan is a creator. Is is a creation. God is the creator. And God has a plan for Satan, and it is not a good plan. Because one day he is going to be cast into the lake of fire, and and hell is no party, pal. It's no party. If you think fire is a party, you're you're in sad shape. But that's what the Bible tells us. That there's a day coming that Satan and all of his wicked, evil angels, those demonic powers, those those uh, satanic powers are going to be cast into that lake of fire along with all of those that followed. I'll tell you, it's a sad day when, when our young people are being, you know, Satan is a liar and the father of lies. And young people in this nation that do not know the truth are falling for his lies. And through the influence of the music of today and all the other things that, that blend in and lend themselves to that, They've got such a wrong idea of what's going on. And Satan has them in his grasp. And folks, it isn't isn't out there just in San Francisco. It's right here in Monroe. We need to understand that this is going on. And we need to know know about it and be alert to it and realize that, that the name of Jesus is where the power is. Well, I tell you what, I, I, don't, I don't mean to get off on this. I, I didn't intend to spend this much time on it, really, but <clears throat> just realize that Jesus is the power. He's the power. He was the power on this day that we're studying about, and He's the power now! Child of God, you say, well, preacher, if the demons are out there, if the spirits, these unclean spirits are there, and they're trying to control my life, and they want to oppress me, What can I do? Here's what you can do, friend. You can get just as full of God as you can get and don't worry about it. That's right. Just get full of God. Just get filled with the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. There was a man that that had had problems with alcohol in his past. And and man, he had quit. He'd taken the pledge. He'd gotten off the booze. And and he was walking down the street one day and he was passing this this, uh, bar. And I mean, the fumes were coming out of there. And boy, he had an attack just like that. I mean, he could just, just... feel almost the fingers of those, that booze, old demon rum reaching out and pulling him into that bar. And, oh man, he was having a struggle. He had to walk by that place. And, and then he saw the little restaurant next door said, buttermilk, 25 cents, all you can drink. Well, he dove into that restaurant. He drank a big old glass of buttermilk. He put that quarter down. He drank another one. He drank another one. He drank about five glasses of buttermilk. Then he went out there and walked right by that bar. Man, he was so full of buttermilk, he couldn't have held a shot of whiskey. <laughs> you, don't know, you don't know how to keep the devil out? Get full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's right. They can't exist in the same place. Amen. Can't stand each other. <laughs> B.L. Moody one night was preaching on this, and he, he had a glass, an empty glass, and he said, How can I empty all the air out of this glass? And the fellow in the audience said, Well, you could get a pump and pump all the air out of it. And he said, No, it wouldn't happen because if I pumped all the air out, it would, it would collapse the glass. It would shatter and break. And they talked back and forth in different ways, and Moody said, Here's the only way to get all the air out of this glass. And he held that glass up, and he took a pitcher of water, and he filled that glass up with water. You want to get all the evil and wickedness out of you? Fill yourself up with the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Here Jesus was, and He was confronted with this, this demonic spirit, and He had power over it. He told it to shut up. Some of the things I've read are so opposite to this about people that are dealing with demonic spirits. They start talking to that spirit and start trying to, to, to find out things and reason with that. Friend, Jesus said, shut up, spirit. That's right. Shut up and get out. And that's what he did. Tore that man. Ripped him. Tore him. Convulsed him. And then the spirit departed. Oh, friend, listen, we start talking about Jesus. We're talking about, we're talking about somebody that is mighty, mighty in word, and mighty in deed. We're talking about authority. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. The question tonight is not does Jesus have authority? The question is does He have, have you allowed that authority to touch your life? Is He in that place of authority in your life? That's the real question tonight. Are you letting Jesus be Jesus in you? Are you? Let's pray about it. Our Father and our God, we're grateful. We're grateful that you haven't left us here in this world at the mercy, which he has no mercy, the mercy of Satan. We're grateful, Lord, that you haven't left us here just to be his plaything. Father, we're grateful that in the power of God, in the power of the Holy Spirit, that, that Jesus can reign in our hearts and through our lives. Lord, we thank you that Jesus is mighty in word and in deed. And we thank you, Lord, that we don't gather together to mourn some martyr from long ago, but we gather to celebrate a living Lord. I thank you he lives in me. Father, I pray for those that have come here tonight that have never made the wonderful discovery of knowing Christ personally. Father, I pray for every person in this room tonight that doesn't know Jesus as their own personal Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray they'd get saved tonight. And then, Father, I pray for your children that although they are children of God, they're not living like children of God. And I pray, Lord, that you'll, by your power, you'll convict them and let them know that they need to get right with you tonight. Father, we're so grateful that Jesus has the power to change lives. And we pray in His name. Let's stand together, please, quietly. Head still bowed and eyes closed. Let me ask you something tonight. Do you know tonight, do you know that you are saved? Do you know that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? But you're saved, no doubt about it. If you were to fall over dead tonight, you know you'd go to heaven. Do you know that? If you don't, that's what these next few minutes are for. It's for you to be able to find out how you too can make that wonderful discovery of knowing Christ. Now, child of God, let me ask you a question. Are you living for God? Are are you in a Christian suit? It's like that fellow was in that monkey suit, that gorilla suit. Some of you may be in Christian suits tonight. Don't you want to get right with God? Aren't you tired of going on, acting and playing on a Christian? Oh, you know that you've been saved, but you're just not living for God. Won't you come tonight during the invitation? There may be somebody here that God is speaking to about full-time service about putting serving God first in their life if that's so I don't want you to go on in indecision I want to say to you like Joshua said choose you today choose you today who you're going to serve this time of invitation is for you you come you come
Joey is playing and Philip is going to sing. You come.